why do I have this? Well, well, one of the reasons is because I got it when I was 12 years old. All right, this is my first telescope. This is a TASCO 5VTE. Those of you that are familiar with the 9VT, the 9TEs and the 10VTEs uh, and the 20TEs with the magnificent equatorial mounts. Okay, I'm not even sure this is counted as a relation to those telescopes. Okay. Um, I got into astronomy via what we used to call earth science back in the day, if you recall earth science classes, which is a combination of geology, astronomy, and that type of thing. And I had, I had really gone heaven and earth to get my parents to give me uh, a telescope. And this showed up on Christmas Day of 1964. All right. So I like it for two reasons. First of all, it's my first telescope. Secondly, it's one of the few telescopes that, while assembled, I can still lift at my age. <laughs> all right, you know, there, there were a lot that I could earlier, and as time has marched on, the number of telescopes I can actually transport while assembled is, is uh, limited. The reason I brought this out was, first of all, many of you have had similar telescopes, whether it was a Sears refractor or, or Edmund reflector, um, you know, ones that you might have bought with grass cutting money or your parents bought for Christmas. Um, but it wasn't always that way. Uh, as a matter of fact, before 1920, the likelihood that your parents could have bought you a telescope okay, of any kind were essentially vanishingly small. Okay, because in those days, astronomy was an occupation for declared scientists and for wealthy amateurs. And one of the things we're going to talk about is how things have changed between now and then as a lead-in to talk about the telescopes that many of us cut our IT on in the 60s and the 70s, and also, uh, in some cases, the telescopes that we fantasized over having, but knew there was never a chance that we would ever have telescopes like that. I drew this, last thing is that I drew this from uh, a group that I belong to on the, cla on the uh, cloudy nights, uh, essentially uh, dialogue. Okay, many of you have been to cloudynights.com. They have a variety of forums. One of them is classic telescopes. Okay, and that's basically looking at telescopes, uh, essentially before 1980. Okay, going back, it could, it could be as far back as the 19th century, although those tend to get into the antique telescope uh, realm. But in any case, uh, that is something that interests me because, first of all, I, I lived in those days. Uh, the history there was part of my life experience uh, of the 50s and 60s. And secondly, because of the fact that uh, the history of what, what, what happened in that, in that time frame really fascinated me. I hope that uh, I hope it will interest you as well. I already mentioned this. Amateur astronomy was a rich man's hobby before World War One. Okay, the names that you would have listened, the names you would have gone to if you were interested in getting a telescope in those days, would have been Alvin Clark and Sons, John Brasher, Henry Fitz. Okay, and there were others, but those were the ones that were call it uh, the premier telescope makers. All right. Um, and many people did get those. Universities obviously had telescopes. Uh, they went to those makers to get them. But wealthy amateurs did as well. The picture on the uh, screen is a picture of, John, of uh, Robert Todd Lincoln's telescope. Okay, he had an estate called Paul Dean up in the Vermont area. And about 75, 80 feet away from his house, he had an observatory built. And he had a Actually, it was a Warner and Swayze telescope, but it had a six-inch pressure lens, all right? Uh, it was deeded after his death to the school district, and the school district, uh, uh, along with the estate, renovated the observatory, renovated the telescope, and put it back into operation about uh, six, seven years ago. So um, those people could get telescopes, but there was a much larger segment of the, of the population that was interested in astronomy. Okay, and we know that because of the fact that 
when Haley's Comet came by, there was a tremendous amount of interest in looking at the comet. There was some degree of trepidation if you read the press at the time, and they were worried about the potential of poisonous gas in the tail, things along those lines. Uh, but the lot, bottom line, there were actually comet pills that you can believe this to essentially uh, prevent adverse effects. At any rate, wide interest in Halley's Comet. Observatory open houses were, were popular. Universities usually were close to cities. People would come, and the astronomy staff would open the observatory uh, for guided uh, views of the heavens. And it was an entrepreneurial age. We actually had sidewalk astronomers in those days, but they were in business for profit. So it was a penny of view, okay? You may see somebody in a park or and say, you want to see this? And uh, it make, uh, try to make some money off that. And that's pretty much where we were at until about 1920. Uh, 1921, uh, a lot of you have heard of Russell Porter. Okay, he began the group known as the Springfield Telescope Makers. Okay, and he, pot in, and he basically uh, published the article, The Poor Man's Telescope. It which talks about the fact that an individual with a reasonable <laughs> command of mathematics, okay, following instructions for building simple equipment and using a manual fabrication technique for mirrors could build a very, very high quality mirror, put it in a telescope tube and mount it on a mount and have something that they could really <coughs> explore the heavens with. So it was published in Popular Astronomy. It did focus on Newtonian reflectors. Um, and the challenge, the, the thing that he, he kept hammering was the fact that you don't need to be a rich person to have a good telescope. You can build good telescopes on your own. All right, so in Springfield, uh, he basically set up the Springfield Telescope Makers. Had about 11 people there to begin with in 1921. Springfield held an annual fair every year. Typical city fair, you know, usually, you know, people baking, people showing a variety of, uh, of uh, things that you would see at a county fair or a city fair. And all of a sudden there was this group of very unusual instruments, and that's the actual exhibit, reflecting telescopes. Most people looked at it and said, what the heck is this? You know, this doesn't look like something that should be at a city fair. Well, the Springfield telescope makers were there. They explained what was going on. They got more members. They actually showed people what they could look at for the telescopes. And things began to take off. And at that point, a gentleman by the name of Albert Engels comes into the picture. He's an editor for Scientific American. He researches various sources to get articles that he can print in that magazine. He comes across the poor man's telescope gets together with uh, Porter, actually gets infected with the amateur telescope making bug. Okay, actually there's correspondence between the two that talk about, I can't get my mirror to come out right on the Foucault test or I don't know what the heck's going on. And it's the classic issue of the turned edge at the end of the, of the edge of the mirror, because you, know, you can correct that if you know how to do it. They then began running a series of articles in 1926 on how to essentially build telescopes. Okay, Scientific American was a national magazine, albeit not with a huge run, but it was the first time this had been exposed. All right, so bottom line is this takes off. Remember, there are a lot of people that are interested in astronomy, but they've never been able to get a good telescope other than people going to an observatory and getting glimpses. Now they have the opportunity to build one on their own. ATM groups sprung up all over the country. Okay, but this is the Los Angeles ATMers in the 1930s. You see the manual mirror making stations in the back, there's a rudimentary machine, okay, run by an electric motor to essentially give them the opportunity to do rough figuring of mirrors. Homemade telescopes became <coughs> extremely inexpensive, even more so than, than they had been in the past. We had people that used stove pipes for, for tubes, for telescopes, okay? I mean, the ingenuity was remarkable, 
Okay, it was all kinds of things that got pressed into pressed into service. People were making equatorial mounts out of plumbing pipes. Okay, in other words, just the they would grease up the threads so that you would get the ability for the mount to rotate <coughs> two degrees of freedom. And those pipes are heavy, and the bottom line is it hurt. So the Great Depression was raging at this time, but it actually it actually wasn't competed because it was inexpensive enough not to be a drain on the family's resources, even if they were having problems in other areas. A wide variety of telescopes and mountings were experimenting with. The Springfield mounting, okay, the, you see the, the uh, Porter Springfield telescope with the stealth in. Um, very unique types of mounts were experimenting with. The state of the art matured and ultimately, they take it into the early 40s when they mobilized for war production um, in the early 40s. There was a tremendous need for optical equipment manufacturing. Okay? The ATMers, who have basically <coughs> now become comparatively numerous, um, that didn't get drafted into wartime service, many of them went into optical companies and learned the business from the standpoint of an ongoing for-profit type of organization. So the classics telescopes era, I'll say that's 1945 to 1980. It's purely arbitrary, okay, but just to give you a time frame. Um, what happened was, fast forward to 1945, you had a situation that just <coughs> for commercial telescopes aimed at the amateur to be made. Okay, first of all, you had people that were very interested, okay, and we, that, that interest in the U.S. It never lapsed. We had strong post-war economy so that there was discretionary income that could be taken towards telescopes. And a lot of these ATMers, okay, with experience in optical business, basically now are in a position to start small entrepreneurial companies which is exactly what they did. Uh, Cave Optical, Thomas Cave, worked for an optical company during World War II, okay, until he was drafted in the Army, and then after he came out of the Army, went back and started Cave Optical. Unitron is an unusual company. It's essentially a marketing and sales entity. It did not construct the telescopes. Those telescopes were constructed in Japan. Um, uh, and uh, their, their product uh, was achromatic reflectors and accessories, anywhere from 1.6 inches up to 6 inches. What you see on the, uh, on the screen there is a 4 inch photo equatorial uh, refractor. Okay, it has, uh, I don't think this, this may or may not work. But it does, great. See this thing right here? That is a weight-driven clock drive. So that basically what you did was you cranked it up, and there's a weight within the pedestal that basically you can crank up to the top of the pedestal, and then you can clutch the uh, weight-driven clock drive in, and it will drive the telescope for about 45 minutes. And then after that, you wind it up again, and you keep going. So no electricity required. All right. Um, so the uh, how they manufactured these in Japan is interesting because uh, for those that have done any reading on the Japanese during World War II, one of the things that kicked the Navy's butt out in the uh, South Pacific initially was the fact that the Japanese had tremendous uh, night optics. Okay, they had uh, <coughs> spectacularly effective telescopes and binoculars. Okay, in many cases, uh, and they practiced using those, uh, and in many cases they were able to get the jump, even on ships that had radar in operation. All right, so um, after the war, most of those, the industry had been destroyed as far as the locations. 
but by and large, the opticians were still alive and looking for looking for business. And the bottom line was they began manufacturing uh, binoculars. Many of you had binoculars that were made in post-war made in post-war Japan. In addition to that, we had uh, you know, a variety of people who had worked on telescopes, uh, and a group called Nihon Seiko, I believe. Uh, was one of the big optical companies over in Japan. And they worked with this consortium, a bunch of mom and pop shops, literally, <coughs> to essentially build the components and the optics for what became Unitron. And why that's interesting is because of the fact that anybody that's trying to restore or basically repair a Unitron, uh, at some point will tear their hair out because of the fact that there is no standardized configuration. Okay, you know, this one has two cams, this one has one. Okay, <laughs> this one has this bunch of gears, this other one has, the, has another. So, if you are, if you're uh, overhauling a Unitron, uh, you have to depend on your friends who have tread that path before, and even then, that doesn't always help. But usually you'll get to where you need to be. There's a huge marketing presence in Sky Telescope. It's hard to see, but it's Santa Claus basically delivering microscopes and telescopes from Unitron, all right? And uh, bottom line is uh, some lucky astronomers will receive Model 160, the photo equatorial for clock drive and astro camera. But if you didn't like that, you could get a microscope. If you didn't like that, you could get binoculars. Edmund Scientific is the, Ar is the Army Circle <coughs> for, for science and optics, or was, okay? You'd be happy to know that Edmund still exists under the, under the name Edmund Optics. All right, and they basically went to that a few years ago. But in the heyday, you know, they basically came about because of the fact that the United States government had a, a ginormous, that's a technical term, set of, of optics basically available for people to take off their hands, all right? And so some smart people that wanted to essentially get into the optics business took the tank, uh, the tank uh, eyepieces, which by the way are the first purples, okay, took the binoculars, took, you know, the spotting scopes, and basically either sold them or parted them into piece parts for invented amateurs to use. And that was Edmund's first business. Actually, their name for a while was Edmund Salvage in the 40s. So the bottom line is, what we're interested in though is what do they do the way telescopes? Newtonian reflectors, a three inch, it was a cardboard tube, it was a starter scope. But when you got to the four and a quarter inch, and the six inch, and the eight inch, uh, you were talking about a very, very substantial telescope. Aluminum tube, <coughs> um, a good German equatorial mount. Uh, that's the four and a quarter inch there. That's a focal 10, okay, so you're looking at essentially a spherical mirror, okay, because at that focal ratio, a sphere will operate as well as a parabola. And that was my second telescope. I bought that off of a friend of mine, okay, who got into astronomy, astronomy and then wasn't all that interested. And uh, my dad sank a uh, pole in the backyard for me in concrete, I helped. And, Basically, uh, I went out there and spent a lot of very pleasant nights. Um, and then also achromatic refractors, refractors three to four inches, a plethora of light pieces, and other neat stuff, so like the Spitz Junior Planetarium, an old planetarium that you could put in a dark room and amaze yourself and your neighbors, mainly yourself. Okay. <laughs> And also, anybody here here will hear of the Spillhouse Space Clock, okay? This is like, it was the neatest gimmick I've ever seen. It had 17 different things it told you. It had 366 tooth translucent plates that rotated at the appropriate uh, rates. And, uh, still looking for one of those, actually. Very high quality optics, okay? Um, the, the refractors, they actually bought the lenses from one of the same sources that supplied Unitron. 
so you know the, the optics in those telescopes are the first rate. Uh, they also one of the folks that had a full line of ATM pits and supplies. So you buy your rouge, you could buy your pitch, you could buy your your uh, your, your uh, mirror blank, your tool blank. I spent a lot of hours grinding a six-inch mirror in the basement. Okay. I won't tell you how that came out because it's sort of depressing. <laughs> um, so there anyway, Edmund Scientific, those scopes are still around. They still operate great. Okay. A lot of these have you know, the same type of characteristics. Uh, you know, it's, uh, they're there for what I call uh, traditional astronomy, the issue of being able to star hop to get to a location. All right. Use the star atlas or knowledge of a constellation to get to where you need to be. Um, and the good thing about this is that the electronics never break. Okay, since there are no electronics. <coughs> cave optical. Talked about Tom Cave a little bit before. Tom Cave was one of the premier Mars observers of the 1930s and 40s. Okay, he was he was an observer in addition in addition to being an, an optician. When he came back from the war, he and a group of his uh, his associates started Cave Optical in the uh, in the early 50s. All right, they basically produced Newtonian reflectors. Uh, they advertised from six inches, essentially six, eight, ten, twelve and a half, uh, and sixteen, and eighteen, and they would make special orders on demand. And then refractors, they bought lenses, uh, as Edmund did, and built a four and five inch uh, refractor. Um, for those of you that like uh, quasars, and there are a lot of people in there, including myself, Cave made the first increment of quasar mirrors. Okay, and then eventually the folks in Cumberland, Pennsylvania, took that over. But, uh, they turned to Cave to essentially make the first increment of the three and a quarter inch uh, Metkusoff uh, mirrors. These folks also had a tremendous marketing position in Sky and Telescope. Uh, and if you take a look at it, that's a 12 and a half inch telescope. Uh, they call it a Model D transportable. Uh, I'll tell you the term transportable is liberally interpreted and probably abused okay, <laughs> in conjunction with the telescope. Okay, it's transportable if there are three of you. Okay. Right, in the truck. Okay. Uh, that's my telescope. Okay. I found it up in upstate New York. Um, so uh, in any case, uh, I'll show you what you can do a little bit here, but that one is a 10 inch deluxe and for people that lost after chrome, okay, <laughs> you're home, okay? This is, that's the way it came from the shop. Chrome paint, <coughs> chrome plated and polished. Cave would also produce uh, tubes in pastel blue and pastel pink and pastel green as well as instrument white. Those were special orders. Problem was that demand consistently outstripped supply. Cave was inherently a mom, mom and pop shop. They were always behind, okay? And people tolerated that based on the good optics. As the 60s yielded to the 70s, uh, things got a little bit, things got a little bit uh, worse. A gentleman uh, by the name of John Beeble was supplying them. Okay, these parts, uh, he was shorted on some of his orders. Diebel didn't like that very much. Uh, he decided he was going to compete with Cave and put Cave out of business. Okay? Anybody know who John Diebel was? He's the CEO of me telescopes. Paul was. So he succeeded. All right. And as a matter of fact, they began building the research grade reflectors, okay, not many people remember them because we were looking at the SCTs, the Schmidt Cassegrain's. grains, but the research grade reflectors are in their essence clones of these Newtonians, and he delivered on time. So, at any rate, uh, 
gave telescopes in superb optics uh, until you get to the late 70s, and then it got a little bit hit and miss as they couldn't keep their workforce stable. So but up until about uh, 77, 78, you could rely on these mirrors being top notch. Six inch telescope was, you either got a three inch refractor or a six inch reflector as a, your graduation to I'm a serious amateur astronomer. Okay, the four and quarters and the 60 millimeters were your break in and then when you were gonna continue, you got one of those scopes. Criterion had been in operation since the 50s and they had a, a series of a very, uh, a very uh, top line uh, telescopes, crackle gray tubes, uh, you know, very, very good <coughs> ears, you know, uh, just everything you want. Uh, but a very smart marketing guy basically said, within the company said, we won't get a price point for the majority of am amateur astronomers if that's what we hold to. So we need to come up with something that preserves the, the, the quality of the optics, which were very high, but yet reduces the price point to the point where people can buy it. Price point they set was, uh, I think, $195 to begin with. <coughs> this is in 1965-66. They basically struck gold, all right? Once the word got out of how good a telescope this was, it came on the clock drive, that's that, that's that, uh, that uh, black box that you see right here. Okay, determine equatorial map. Once people found out how good this was, uh, they basically sold uh, like hotcakes, all right? At the same time, Edmund had basically hit the same price point for what they called the Super Space Cockroach, which was the six inch telescope that they had, also tremendous optics, heavy mount. Uh, this is a Bakelite tube, you know, essentially a plastic, uh, reinforced plastic tube. Um, Edmund had a, had a, uh, a rolled aluminum tube. That's really about the only difference between the two. Also, same price point, and they battled it out for 15 years. Okay, with respect to who it was that uh, was going to control the market, they both got great market share, and there are thousands of these telescopes still out there. Okay, if I were to recommend to somebody who wanted to get a really good telescope without all of the electronics, I would, without recommendation. Uh, recommend either an Edmund Super Space Conqueror or an RV6. You know, you have to do due diligence to make sure that things aren't broken. But if it is uh, in reasonably good shape, they're very good telescopes. Criterion's end was sort of a tragedy. They basically wanted to compete with Celestron and produce good Schmidt Cassegrain telescopes. And the DX6 and the DX8, okay, which are the six and eight inch versions of Schmidt Cassegrain. The problem was they got too close to Celestron's uh, master block method of making corrector plates, the glass corrector plate at the front of the telescope. They were sued for patent infringement. Uh, they basically backed off that and they went to a method of making those corrector plates that to be blunt didn't work. <coughs> So if you see a DX8 or a DX6, they're really beautiful telescopes. If you're looking for it as an art accent to your living room, I highly recommend it. Or if you adapt it to be a uh, solar toaster, okay, using the mirror, it probably work too. They are not good telescopes, all right. And a lot of people have tried to make them good telescopes. The only way you do that is literally to fabricate a new corrector and that is not a trivial exercise. So they were bought up by Bosch and Lom in the late 70s. Celestron, okay? Quite a story. Um, there was a blue and white phase when Tom Johnson first started the company. That was primarily aimed at colleges, okay? And they made telescopes from four inches all the way up to 22 inches. Okay, and there are examples of those still in service throughout the United States. They eventually said, though, we're not going to get enough business with colleges. 
and scientific groups, we need to appeal to the amateur astronomer. So they basically went in, they made the design a little bit less robust in a couple of areas, but still functional. And then because it was the 70s and it was California, that's the only reason I can come up with for the orange and gray paint scheme. Okay. You know, it certainly differentiated them from every other telescope maker in the entire world. Okay, so orange and gray was the uh, was the new white and uh, black. That began about 1970. All right, and the rest is history. Tom Johnson got into telescope making. He was the CEO of Valor Electronics and was doing a great job out in Southern California. His kids wanted a telescope. So what did he do? He made one, okay? And I'm probably gonna correct it from the audience, but I think it was an 18-inch Schmidt Cassegrain on a dolly that looked like the chassis of a of a dump uh, of a uh, pickup truck. He rolled this into one of the Southern California star parties and created a sensation. Nobody had ever seen an 18-inch telescope that had a tube about five feet long. All right, so the reaction he got was, uh, was tremendous. And so he shifted from electronics into telescope manufacturing. All right, and the rest is history. There was a sea change in telescope manufacturer and in telescope purchasing. And that sea change, you know, their boats rose like boats in the Bay of Funding, you know, 40 feet on high tide. Okay, everybody else who was making telescopes took a hit. Cave took a hit, okay. Coast Instruments took a hit, Starliner took a hit. Because the form factor, you know, the difference between having a focal eight or focal eight or focal 10 length tube as opposed to a, uh, a folded light path, where I'm looking at a focal 10 or a focal 11, <coughs> much shorter tube and easy to carry, um, sold the day. So, you know, great for them, but it did create changes in the, in, the, uh, in the telescope market that we still feel today. Question. Matthew Soft Castle Green Reflector comes from a Soviet uh, design, which we found, about, found out about in 1944. That's the name, Matt <coughs> that's his name, the person that came up with it. A deep spherical mirror, uh, and basically a, uh, a deep corrector plate on the front. They developed it to be the, the telescope in a box that you could take with you, literally that box that she's carrying is what the telescope and all of its gadgets go into, okay, another scientific term. Uh, bottom line is that uh, they've been in continuous production since 1954, all right, and from a standpoint of industrial art, uh, it doesn't get much better than that. And their optics are tremendous to boot. So what ended the classic era? Okay. From a use standpoint, the classic era has never ended because these telescopes are still in use. All right. But from a manufacturer standpoint, it did end. The dominance of the SCT, we talked about that already, you know, smaller footprint. Uh, you know, uh, bigger aperture uh, from a standpoint of portability sold a lot of people. The, the advent of apochromatic optics, okay? For those of you that don't know what apochromatic optics are, uh, it's essentially a three element lens as opposed to a two element lens, with one of the elements being a rare earth glass, okay? It takes a lot of time to make these, Ask anybody who's been on the waiting list for an astrophysics telescope, okay? It can be years, but the wait is worth it, okay? Short focal length comparatively and unbelievable views. And then the fusion of computers and telescopes, okay? Go to technology where I can, after I align it, I can you know, dial up a particular object and the scope will whir and, and slew its way to essentially put it in the eyepiece view. And the fact that I can link star atlases on, on uh, laptops, okay, with the control <coughs> surface of my telescope and essentially dial and slew from a star atlas, okay, 
these are all things that are really nice to have. Class 6 telescopes are still used for a variety of purposes. Visual observation, okay, the optics are the optics. They're still good and they provide, they provide really good views. Outreach, okay. Um, a telescope like that or an RV6 is comparatively simple and a, and a middle schooler can use it and you're not worried about frying electronics or doing other damage. Uh, perfect, you know, for that type of a, that type of a uh, operation. And photography, now that we've gone into video astrophotography, we're not looking at long times, uh, essentially doing time exposures. Um, these are as good as the others, even with their synchronous drives, to essentially get all uh, the types of things that uh, you can get with respect to uh, deep sky objects or, um, or planets. Why do I say that? Well, you know, proof is in the pudding. Uh, two pictures uh, of the moon. One was taken via uh, the cave uh, 12 and a half inch uh, in 2015. The other one this year was taken in, with the C14 orange tube. Anybody care to venture what the camera was that captured these pictures? It's a, it's a Galaxy uh, 5 smartphone. Okay. There are astrophotographers rolling over in their graves. <laughs> okay, because in the past you had to essentially line yourself up and guide for minutes or even hours to essentially get pictures of uh, light quality. But that's the type of optics that you have, and actually the pictures don't do justice to the, to the view. Uh, what you're looking at. Okay. Exhibiting. Okay, people are interested in classic telescopes because it's part of our history. They're beautiful industrial art. Okay, some like to collect, some like to refurbish. For the last three years, uh, I've been a part of a group that goes up to the Northeast Astronomy Forum. And the Northeast Astronomy Forum gives us two boots free of charge to bring classic telescopes up uh, and essentially create an exhibit for individuals to go look at. Uh, the reaction you know, from the NEAC doors, okay, who are state-of-the-art astronomers, amateur astronomers, has been unbelievable. They basically come and they come back and they come back again to take a look at these. In many cases, they're saying, I had that telescope, okay? And then we tell star stories and that instead of sea stories. But a couple of things in this picture. That's a cave, Richard's Field Telescope. <coughs> okay, a six inch uh, focal like four. Um, that's a, a Unitron there. Uh, that is a Super Space Conqueror. And that is a four inch uh, Edmund refractor. And there's a lot of others that are there too. But we go up, uh, set it up, uh, usually between five and eight of us that do that. And um, it's up for two days, then we break it down again and we drive it back. And it's a lot of fun. There are a lot of these scopes that are in basements, in attics, in college physics uh, storerooms, okay, that are basically haven't seen the light of the stars for 30, 40, 50 years. That is in a college observatory in which we're making this on the left hand side. That is a 16 inch F4 Newtonian F16 Cassegrain cave telescope. Okay, on an observatory mount, okay, with uh, slow motions and uh, the whole nine yards. All right. The observatory. Uh, was identified you know, because basically we take a look at you know where these telescopes may have gone and one of our folks got permission to go up there and it turned out the observatory had not been entered for 29 years. All right. When it was entered, okay, um, we found out that uh, part of the flashing around the bottom of the dome had deteriorated. And so when the astronomers moved out, the birds moved in. Okay. Uh, with that piece of information, I don't think I need to tell you 
okay, what these uh, strips are here and here and there, okay. And the entire tube was full from on top of the mirror to the top of the tube with straw. Okay. It was a, uh, it was a uh, magnificent nesting place for multiple generations of birds. Long story short is that uh, the uh, college basically allowed this gentleman to purchase it for a donation, okay, and to get a crane to essentially lift the components off and essentially bring them down, okay, and put them on the back of a flatbed truck. Uh, it's currently being, uh, currently being renovated. This is a cave, 12 and a half inch uh, Model D observatory, or uh, Model D uh, transporter. Okay, you saw what one looked like that was in reasonably good shape. This one had been in the backyard for about 20 years. The gentleman who the amateur astronomer who had had it, basically had died, his wife left it out, okay, for 20 years. And uh, the bottom line is, when one of the, another renovator bought this, uh, he attempted to dismount the tube, and the tube fell apart as he was trying to essentially lift it out of the cradle. Luckily, he was in a position to make a uh, fielder's catch on the 12 and a half inch mirror itself, okay, which was heading to the ground. And so the, the tube <coughs> could be restored, but the mount and the uh, clock drive, you know, the optics could be cleaned and uh, re -alumnized. So, you know, there's, uh, you know, again, both from an industrial art standpoint, because of the fact that they were very good telescopes, uh, it's something that we try to do whenever we get the opportunity to put one of these back into service. So, that's, uh, that's uh, what I had to cover. And uh, plastic telescopes came about because of the fact that the United States who's interested in astronomy, they always have been. They became amateur telescope makers, those people became businessmen, and basically helped fuel the big expansion of amateur astronomy in the 50s through the 70s. So we're in their debt.